Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. I think all of the characters in this book on all, all sides, in one way or the other, are grappling with change in their lives and they're living in confounding disorienting times and trying to gain some measure of control against that backdrop and there was something that was very contemporary about that given the difficult period that we all have just lived through with with covid that that made it feel that much more contemporary to me Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 90. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured, or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Michael Punk about his new book, Ridgeline. Michael Punk is the author of several books, including The Revenant, a number one New York Times bestseller and basis for the Academy Award winning film. In his diverse professional career, Punk has served as the U.S. Ambassador to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, history correspondent for the Montana Quarterly, and an adjunct professor at the University of Montana. As a high school and college student, he worked summers as a living history interpreter at Fort Laramie National Historic Site in Wyoming. He lives with his family in Montana and is an avid outdoorsman. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. This is your host, John Monaster. I am here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn with faraway author Michael Punk, author of Ridgeline. Michael, say hello. Hey, everybody. Michael, where are you coming from today? I am coming live from beautiful Flathead Lake in Montana. Wow. And so what is Flathead Lake like? Flathead Lake is really stunningly beautiful. It's the mm. it's a massive freshwater lake in western Montana at the base of Glacier National Park. So it's a it's a beautiful spot. Wow. Awesome. Uh, are you going to go hiking? Do you have big activities planned? So it's pretty hot out here today mm. and we probably will spend some time in the in the lake before it's uh it's all said and done. Possibly hike depending on how the day unfolds. Sounds good. All right. Well uh we'll talk about your awesome book and then we'll let you get back out to beautiful nature and to <laughs> and to enjoy enjoying Fantastic. your time in the lake. Uh but yeah, let's turn in this book Ridgeline, which is just absolutely fascinating. Another dip into kind of historical waters for you. So, you know, I obviously you wrote the revenant before this, and that was a particular moment in history. So, um, I don't know. Well, first off, why don't you just sort of tell us a little bit about what Ridgeline is about in your own words, and then maybe sure. we'll get into kind of why you ended up at this moment. Sure. So Ridgeline, as you said, is historical fiction, but based on this true incident, uh, it, the, the book culminates with this massive battle that took place in what's now Wyoming in the Powder River Valley on December 21st, 1866. And at the time, it was the known as the worst defeat of the U.S. Army in U.S. military history and was a very famous battle for about 10 years when another famous battle happened, the Battle of Little Bighorn, where Custer and all of his men were killed. And the drama of Custer's battle was such that it kind of subsumed the Fetterman fight, which is the name of the battle that my book is about. But it's it's one of those incidents in history to me that uh, when you when you learn about it, you kind of can't believe that you didn't know more about it before. And the book, as I said, 
uh, culminates with this with this Fetterman fight. But the first half of the book is really about the the months leading up to that fight and the conflict between several of the Native American tribes who are living in that area as their land is invaded by this uh, huge force of, of, of U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, like you said, it is, this is kind of a interesting moment because, yeah, I, I guess if you had to, if you kind of grab someone on the street and said, do you, which of these two do have you heard of? The little big right. one will probably be the one people have heard of. So you're right. It kind of got subsumed by that. So why did, why did you end up picking this one to, to write about? Well, when I am looking for a topic for a historical fiction book, I kind of look for a historical story that I think has all of the elements that make for great storytelling, just in terms of drama and action. And this one has that in, uh, in you know, large quantity. Mm -hmm. I look for a story that naturally has great characters who, are, who, who tell the story. And this one has wonderful characters uh, on the Native American side. There's the great chief, Red Cloud. There's Crazy Horse, who a lot of people have heard of, but kind of think of more uh, in a later life stage when he, when he also is, is 10 years older and a great chief, namely in connection with the events of the Battle of Little Bighorn and a couple of years that surrounded that. One of the things I love about Crazy Horse in this era is he's, he's a young person, a young man and still much more impulsive than he probably was later in his life. He makes mistakes. In some ways, he's much more human at this stage of his life than when he becomes the, the, the great chief that he uh, rises later on to become. Um, there's great characters on the side of the U.S. Army, uh, a huge amount of conflict among the officers that are the kind of key decision makers in developing the the approach that the U.S. Army takes at this time. There are a couple of characters that are kind of grizzled old scouts, Jim Bridger and James Beckworth. Jim Bridger, for anybody who read The Revenant, was a character in true life in the events of The Revenant, but that story takes place in 1823, 40 years earlier when Jim Bridger was a 19-year-old boy. In this story, in 1866, he's a 62-year-old man and uh i i've always been in love with this character and it's fun for me to see him and to play with him at a at a very different life stage um there are some very compelling uh female characters in this in this story in real life uh, and it was fun to bring that element into a frontier story women very often get left out of of western history storytelling inappropriately and and this story was had a very natural vehicle to kind of tell those stories so it had a lot of elements that were compelling to me as a as a storyteller just in terms of the what actually happened in history and that was 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 fun to play with in in writing the novel yeah and you know one of the things that is that was sort of very obvious of course as you start reading the book is that it's set in the past and it also uses all of kind of the, the concepts and precepts and, and mindsets and, and, and takes you to that place. And so uh, I guess one of the, the things that immediately set, stood out to me was, of course, the, the terms Indians and whites, which is probably not how people would refer to, you know, groups like that today. And even, you know, as you describe throughout the book, uh, just as there's not one homogenous group of Indians, there's not one homogenous group of whites, there's a plethora of different you know, peoples that are all coming together here. So just curious about how you decided to use those terms and, and any other terms that were kind of historically accurate, but maybe might not be ones that are comfortable, say, to some people today. Sure. Well, it's, it's tricky when you're writing something that's historical, because on the one hand, uh, you want to be respectful of how people are looking at those types of terms today. At the same time, in trying to write through uh, the eyes of historical characters, or especially in trying to write dialogue of historical characters, uh, I want it to sound true. And so in speaking in those characters' voices, oftentimes I would use terms that would, would not be terms that would be appropriate today. Yeah. And and so let's let's kind of get into the book and some of the... Uh 
kind of some of the story elements. And, sure. and so we, we talked about Crazy Horse and how a lot of people might know him from a bit later in life, but this is kind of his, his beginnings and he was much younger throughout this novel. Um, and, and you actually have a part where it kind of goes back and even looks back in, in his mind to his past and, and has uh-huh. him thinking about how he became who he was. And so I, I was really fascinated by the story of how he got his name and his relationship yeah. with his father. So how do you think that that kind of made him into who he is and maybe even tying that to any information you have about who he became after the events of this book? Sure. Well, Crazy Horse has been a hero of mine since I was a little boy. I mean, I can remember checking out a biography of Crazy Horse when I was in third grade from the library at the elementary school where I went in in Lovell, Wyoming. So this has been a a character that is a, a historical character that has been in my head for a long time. And one of the things that was most striking to me in doing the research about Crazy Horse for this book is we think of him in such mythical terms and that he almost becomes uh, somebody who's not uh, a person anymore. Uh, And uh, I have to say that the more research that I did about Crazy Horse, uh, the more he became mythical to me Mm -hmm. uh, and someone who I just, for whom uh, uh, all of the respect that I had to to begin with grew. And uh, that said, of course, he he progressed through the course of his life and uh, incorporated experiences that he was having in an incredibly trying time to be uh, uh, living uh, among the indigenous tribes in our country. But one of the things that's interesting to me about him is there were two uh, older men who had a very significant influence on, on I think, who he became as a, as a man. And one of them was his uncle, a, a character that I portray in the, in the book named High Backbone. And High Backbone was a, a, a military chief, a military leader, also uh, a great hunter. And he really uh, teaches Crazy Horse a lot of those aspects of, of, of his life. His father was a spiritual leader and his father's name was Crazy Horse before he gave the name ultimately to his son. But one of the things that is so interesting to me about about Crazy Horse getting his name, as you say, is after after Crazy Horse the boy goes off on this this vision quest, this effort to kind of really find himself as a a, a, a teenage boy, he comes back and he's received this this vision about uh, that kind of points the way to sort of things that will occur to him over the course of his life. And at that juncture, his father, Crazy Horse, gives uh, his son the name Crazy Horse, and his father takes on a new name. Uh, They didn't have the same name at the same time. And the name that his father takes on after giving his name to his son is Worm. And I think part of the reason that he took that name on was to demonstrate his humility. I mean, the worm obviously is a, is a humble creature. And that humility becomes key to understanding who Crazy Horse is. And throughout his life, he was known as someone who put the needs of others, people in his tribe before his own, someone who did not sing his own praises, even after these remarkably heroic incidents in, in battle and who just very much embodied humility. And I love that combination of greatness on the one hand, which you can't look at Crazy Horse's life and not see greatness, but at the same time, humility. It's it's a great lesson for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a really interesting uh, uh, character. Um, So I kind of want to touch on a couple things, see if I can, can pull them in together here, but... I think one thing that I noticed, you know, that throughout the book, there are these kind of patterns where the, um, the indigenous peoples would kind of go after elements of the fort or the, uh, the whites or whatever else and kind of do these little attacks. And it, it just seemed like throughout the book, they sort of had the upper hand in a, in a sort of way. And it seemed like the, uh, the people in the fort were just prone to very much underestimating 
who they were up against. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they really kind of infantilized them in a lot of ways, it seemed like. And you mentioned the character of Jim Bridger, and it seemed like Jim yeah. Bridger was one of the few people that didn't do that, you know, that was routinely yeah. trying to give them this advice that was like, don't put your fort there. That's a bad idea. Like, don't do the hits. Yeah. Don't do that. Like, there, you know, things are going to happen. You're, you're setting a chain of events in motion here. So it, to me, it felt like kind of not only were the whites in the book so prone to underestimating the, the Indians, but they also couldn't listen to advice from someone who was an expert on those Indians to, to help them get around yeah. that blind spot. I mean, and, and I think it seems like that's kind of ultimately what, what led to, you know, all the way through the, the end of the book's events. So I'm just curious if you had insight as to, to why that happened to that degree, you know, why were we just so focused yeah. in without, and, and, you know, and maybe blind to our blind spots, if that makes sense. Well, I, the the simple answer is i think there was a significant amount of racism in the perspective of the u.s army and i'm speaking about the u.s army as a as an entity and that's mm -hmm. there were obviously different uh many different soldiers with many different perspectives and so that's a, a bit of a gross characterization on my part but generally speaking i think there was significant racism on the part of the u.s army in how it viewed the abilities of the uh the indigenous tribes as military opponents and i think on the one hand there was a fear and a, a decent amount of respect for the ability of the of the various tribes to mount these kind of small hit and run guerrilla style attacks and over the course of the fall leading up to this huge battle those are precisely the types of, of attacks that Red Cloud was uh, 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 directing uh, take place, that leaders like Crazy Horse were, were leading on the ground in, in small groups. And so the soldiers had seen that type of kind of hit and run attack, and they knew that the, that the Lakota and the Cheyenne were extremely adept horsemen, for example. And so there, there, was, there was some fear and respect along those lines. But what I think they did not imagine at all, and this is, again, in part because of, of assumptions, that they, racist assumptions that they made about the ability of the, of the indigenous peoples to cohere in a broader military strategy, is the U.S. Army did not imagine that the tribes would have the ability to come together in a massive coalition put on a battlefield a huge force of warriors and by a huge force i'm talking about you know estimates are something like 2000 warriors that were dispatched as as the, the the group that went out to fight this final battle that one of the things that is so interesting to me about this story is we've been talking about crazy horse who was the young man that was leading kind of small war parties red cloud is the older chief in at this time in history and really was the the kind of strategic and diplomatic leader of the tribes and what i think red cloud saw is that he was being underestimated in terms of how the u.s army saw his capabilities and he uses that as a weapon mm -hmm. and he first of all the uh, red cloud does two things that turn out to be you know, uh, brilliant. Number one, he creates a coalition of multiple tribes that was not something that the U.S. Army was anticipating. So he brings together the Oglala, the Minicauju, he brings together the Cheyenne, he brings together the Arapaho in this massive configuration that the Army didn't anticipate it would come together. And then the other thing that that Red Cloud does that was that was brilliant is he figures out very quickly that the place that not to fight the U.S. Army is at this massive fort that they have built where they have cannons and all of the advantages. The place to fight the U.S. Army was away from the fort. Mm -hmm. But of course, the trick was to get a large number of soldiers away from the fort. And that was kind of the, the tactics of that last fight. And where Crazy Horse came into play, leading a group of 
decoys on the day of the battle that very brilliantly leads the U.S. Army, entices the Army out of the fort, and then leads them far away from the fort over this fateful ridgeline where the final battle takes place. Yeah. And now to kind of turn it over to the to the Army side of things, so you mentioned earlier there were all of these kind of uh, conflicts between officers in charge at the at the fort, and uh, it was really interesting to see those play out in the book and see the different styles of people and the, the arguing and then trying to you know, f- right. figure out how to respond to, to all this, um, kind of one of those like fly on the wall situations. And so we have kind of at the very top of it all, we have Carrington, the kind of leader, uh, right. person in charge. And he was, uh, you know, very much just a, a man following orders and that he was told to build a fort and it was told to wait to engage until later. And that was kind of what he was trying to do. But he also wasn't really, you know, maybe a warrior, for, know, for lack of a better word. He wasn't a big yeah, fighter. Yeah, not at all. You know, that wasn't his thing. He was and, a logistics and, guy. Yeah, exactly. And and you talk about that. And, and so, you know, all these other officers that were with him and talking to him, you know, w- would fight with one another. And, and it was often difficult for him to kind of figure it out, I think, and, and know how to kind of lead people because of that lack that he had there. So, right. I mean... Just thinking about that, I, I feel like, of course, there must have been, there have to have been many other situations where people are in kind of a similar place where they're in charge. Maybe they don't have as much like knowledge about a certain area as people that are underneath them, but they're still responsible for leading. So, you know, wh- why was his leadership so effective here? You know, like, was there anything he could have done better? And, and are there any kind of leadership lessons to take away here? Well, one of the lessons about, uh, uh, about Carrington is uh, is that you know you, you you need to pick the right person for the job, and Carrington was the exact wrong person for the job that he ended up having. He he was as you mentioned, all of the officers in this uh, in this story, uh, as a matter of history, were were uh, experienced officers from the from from the Civil War. Uh, but Carrington had no combat experience. He had been a logistics officer in, in the Civil War. And I think the U.S. Army, in its wisdom, kind of imagined that Carrington might go out to this place over the course of the fall and winter of 1866, 1867. And the only thing he would be doing was building this fort. And then uh, when the fort was built, they would send out different more soldiers uh officers with a, you know different experience in the springtime to actually go fight a war uh but the way it works out is it, it is the chronology doesn't work out that way at all all of this happens at the same time as as carrington is building his fort the war comes to him and that's of course what red cloud does is brings the fight to the u.s army and so this guy who would be a very good mayor and actually was quite good at the, the mechanics of building a massive fort. Uh, he's, he's good at that, but he's, he's bad at the fighting part, and the fight comes to him. And when that starts to happen, the, he's not able to, there's a huge amount of conflict, as you say, among the officers. Uh, and even though Carrington is in command, these junior officers end up having a huge amount of influence because all of them have been uh, have a lot of experience in fighting in the Civil War. They're all combat veterans, and in some cases, even heroes. And Carrington, I portray him as having a lot of insecurity about that, and as, in part as a result of that insecurity, giving in to his junior officers when he should know better. And one of the reasons, as you mentioned, that he should know better is he's getting advice from very experienced people like Jim Bridger. And even though Carrington's junior officers have experience in combat, it's a very different type of combat. It's civil war. It's fighting against the Confederate army in the civil war. None of his junior officers know anything about fighting against the, the uh, tribes on the American frontier. And so Jim Bridger could have been an enormously helpful influence if they had taken his advice but at juncture after juncture as you mentioned before 
they don't. So there's this just, you know, from a storytelling standpoint, it, you can see this calamity sort of unfolding over the course of the fall, all building up to this to this battle at the at the end of the book. Yeah, and I feel like one of maybe Carrington Carrington's actually chief foil is this guy Grummond, and just really at every moment when Carrington tries to roll things back, Grummond is ready to push things forward and wants to fight and attack and engage, um, and. And I thought it was very interesting because uh, of the way he's portrayed, because he, it's not just that he's a troublemaker, but he's sort, of, he's sort of a very charismatic troublemaker. He's able to get people to his side. He knows what to say and how to say it. And some of the other officers even kind of resent him for that. They, they kind of understand what he's up to. He's, he's very manipulative. And I feel like that, that type of personality is, is, you know, I've run into that type of personality. Like, I, I'm sure we've, we've seen kind of that person that we know, like, these aren't the best ideas, but boy, are they presented well. Like, boy, you know, they get people to pay attention to them somehow. Um, so, you know, you mentioned with Carrington in this, you know, what, what, he just wasn't the right person, probably. And in this case, he just was maybe completely outmanned by Grumman. But, you know, what what was there to do about that situation? You know, in this case, what, was there anything that the other officers could have done more? I mean, in kind of doing like a postmortem yeah. of that that event and all of the, the people involved. I mean, it really seems like the, containing Grumman would have presumably, you know, stopped almost all of this from happening. So it's a super interesting question. And I think it's one of the, the, from a historical standpoint, it's one of the most important kind of lessons to be drawn from the book is, as you say, there are people uh, like Grumman's in all walks of of life, uh, people who are, are highly charismatic, who are very good at rallying other people. Sometimes, by the way, and this is certainly the case with Grummond, by playing to other people's worst instincts, but understanding how to fan those types of instincts in a very effective way. And Grummond is, to me, the essence of one of those types of characters. And honestly, those types of characters are are fairly easy to write hmm. because of what precisely what you said, because we see people like that all the time. And in some ways, they're almost, you know, cartoons of themselves, but also quite effective. To me, what was interesting to play with in the book was the officers around around Grummond and how they reacted to him uh, and how they succeeded or failed in uh, trying to channel his worst instincts into a better place. And without revealing too much, uh, they're not ultimately very successful in, in channeling Grummond's worst instincts. And, and, you know, so Grummond was there and, and part of one of the things that was interesting about this, about this book, like you mentioned, was that the the U.S. Army came with women and children, and it wasn't just the the army um, and the soldiers. And so Grumman came with his wife, Francis, right. and uh, Francis kept a journal. Francis actually kept two journals throughout the book, and and I have to say, I really enjoyed those those times. You good. know, it felt like a really good excellent check in as to kind of getting the sense of oh right, there's there's a whole world here. And, and it's an opportunity to just pause and, and, okay, yes, there's two sides and they're fighting and battling, but there's also an entire fort with all these people and all these different things happening. And, and you get to hear like efforts surrounding building a library and teaching people how to read and what, what's going on there. But, uh, but as that happens, you know, you see this kind of public journal and private journal that she has. And in my mind, the two started out pretty aligned or pretty coherent or cohesive with one another and as the book got along they became further and further separated in the sense that the, right. the space between the the reality of the private journal and the kind of uh se semi-truths that were uh presented in the public journal uh kept kept getting bigger i guess and and you know her problems kept mounting right. and I, I thought that was really interesting and just wanted to check in on kind of that that idea of, of keeping two journals like that and yeah. and using that as a way of maybe kind of sequestering your thoughts 
and uh, maybe even just the extent that that we sort of do that to some degree. Like, are we diluting diluting ourselves a little bit with a with a public journal kind of sometimes? Well, I'll tell you where the idea for the presenting Francis Grumman's story through journals came. And the, the journals are part of the book that's completely fictionalized. I, mm -hmm. I made up those entries, both the entries to the her kind of official journal, the kind of Pollyannish, you know, kind of uh, uh, sugar-coated version of the story, and also her secret journal where she reveals her, her true thoughts. The in and and Francis Grumman, uh, who, as you said, is the wife of this kind of villainous uh, officer, is a true character. She's a true life person, just like virtually everyone else in the book. And in doing the research on her, she wrote an autobiography in at the turn of the of the century. And so it was great because I had the opportunity to read words that she had actually written, you know, in, and get a feel for her voice. And so that gave me the idea of presenting her character through journal entries. Mm -hmm. I also have just really enjoyed reading historical journals as part of the kind of research process on these, on these, these books that I've written, because they're just, they're, they're interesting. They're kind of voyeuristic. They're first person. It's you, it, it makes the people seem much more real because they're writing as normal people about their day-to-day -day lives. And I thought that that mechanism would be fun to kind of inject into the the narrative of the broader uh, story. And I'm glad for you anyway, that, that it, it, it worked, it sounds like, but mm -hmm. it, the idea, I had the idea uh, first of having telling your stories through, through a journal, but then something that was very striking to me and has been striking for a long time about the, the role of, of women in the 19th century, and I think that's something that carries through oftentimes even to today, is that women in the 19th century were expected to live their lives inside a very narrow confines. And what they were allowed to say and do and think uh, had to happen uh, in those, those very narrow confines. And what her official journal reflects is her writing for what she probably anticipates will be at some day, uh, you know, her children and a, pub a more public audience. Uh, and so she writes within those confines that she th thinks she's supposed to, to live her life. But it was hard to imagine that somebody in the type of stressful situation that she was in and she ends up, she's a 19 year old uh, woman who's recently married to this uh, man who ends up being very different from the man she thought she married. She ends up, she marries him thinking that her, she's going to go live with him as a army officer's wife in New York City. They're in New York City for a couple of months and all of a sudden he gets transferred to the, one of the most remote and dangerous places on the, on the continent. She finds herself all of a sudden in the Powder River Valley in the middle of a war she discovers she's pregnant at the beginning of right when the army is kind of arriving at this place where they're going to build a fort so she's in an incredibly stressful and uh, tense situation with mm -hmm. these e expectations of thinking inside of, of narrow confines and of course she must have been having other thoughts that were her own thoughts that were different from what was publicly acceptable and to me that was the fun of having the idea of a secret journal that she's keeping at the same time. And so I would present her story, first of all, through an entry in her official journal and then have her turn to what she was writing in her, in her secret journal. So that's kind of the, the mechanism for her, for her character. Yeah. Well, one other thing I want to turn to now is, is sort of the, the idea of technology. And I think uh, technology clearly played a large role in this book. Uh, but to me, it was very interesting because it, it shifted back and forth a lot. It, it wasn't just a simple formula where, oh, the army had better technology, so that means they just won immediately. Uh, it was obviously very nuanced and complicated. And, uh, you know, kind of there, there's a lot of fear, however, from um, the indigenous tribes. And, and, you know, we hear Crazy Horse kind of thinking about this and trying to understand what this means when, 
various new technologies are deployed against them, or they're right. seeing things happen that, that appear miraculous, or they don't they don't quite understand. But at the same time, you know, they, they do adopt some of those, especially weapons, and and you know, at times they will you know steal a bunch of guns or bullets or, mm -hmm. or otherwise. But at the same time, you know, you'll see Crazy Horse feel at times that like maybe he doesn't want that because he doesn't want to be forced to, you know, be reliant upon his enemy the for their weapons. Right. Yeah, which is, I think, is a quite smart thought. Um, but it, it was definitely very disquieting for him to see some of the kind of, especially the um, like kind of, I don't know, machine gun or whatever, the guns that could shoot very quickly without needing to be reloaded. Yeah. Repeating rifles. Repeating rifles. Thank repeating you. pistols, right. Yeah. And so I'm just curious to know, you know, maybe as you did all of this research about how all of the different technology, how, how that felt between the different groups. And, um, you know, ultimately, ob obviously, the, as this was termed, the, a massacre, one of the worst U.S. Army defeats, the technology didn't necessarily save the day here um, yeah. for the U.S. Army. So I'm just curious to know about how that interplay went throughout the book and how you thought about how to depict the various different weapons and styles of yeah. um, styles of tactics even used? Well, it's, I think it's very, I think te technology is, is interesting in and of itself, just as, as a, a topic, because it's obviously something that we think about a lot today in terms of new technologies and what is the balance between uh, good of that, of that technology and, and, and concerns that it might raise. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to remember that people have been having, have been posing that question about technology forever. And, uh, and every generation has, has new types of technology that are uh, coming into to broader use and having an impact on events. And, and that certainly is true of weapons technology. And one thing that wars do, and in 1866, the U.S. had just emerged from the Civil War, is wars tend to dramatically accelerate the development of technology, especially weapons technology. And so during the war, there were dramatic improvements in weapons technology, whether it was the ability of artillery to be used in very precise ways, whether it was the development of repeating rifles. People may know that during the Civil War, most of the, the foot soldiers were using single shot rifles that were loaded from the muzzle. This is the, using the, 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 the ram staff that, uh, that uh, pushes the charge down the, the barrel of the, of the gun and then fires one shot at a time. During the Civil War, repeating rifles were were developed. They weren't widely deployed to foot soldiers, but they were developed and changed very dramatically how quickly a gun could be could be fired. And those uh, it's interesting, as you mentioned, because all of that technology was not enough to, to save the US Army in this instance, in part because the Army had made the decision not to give those types of weapons to most of their of their soldiers. So uh, the soldiers that are fighting in the fights that I'm depicting were mostly still using those kind of Civil War era single shot muzzle loading rifles. And at this era, most of the of the of the indigenous fighters were still relying upon uh, bows and arrows, which in some ways were much more effective because they could be fired so much more rapidly. So that there has not been really the, a tipping point in terms of the the uh, uh, the benefit of particular weapons technologies on the on the frontier, and uh, but I do think, and this is kind of what I focus on in terms of what I write about, that seeing some of those technologies come onto the frontier, on into their into their into their land. Uh, Crazy Horse, seeing uh, in weapons that they had captured, for example, repeating weapons and imagining the potency that that could have as a force being used against them must have been profoundly disquieting. Not to mention mm -hmm. something like the cannons, which, as I, as I said, people think of a cannonball firing out and being used to kind of knock down a wall. 
uh, in a civil war, there were technologies developed, which they had on the frontier, even at this fort that I write about, that allowed a, a cannonball to be fired out over uh, a thousand yards and explode at a very precise place downrange and, you know, throw out uh, dozens of, of lethal smaller uh, projectiles. And it was, it was an awesome weapon and it must have been hugely intimidating. And that's the piece of it that I try and write about. Yeah. Um, one other character that, you know, we didn't get a lot of exposure to in the book, but a little bit here and there. And I just found it really interesting because I, I guess I never would have thought that a historical fiction book would have had a character like this, but this is um, the character of Moon, who is the, the Wink, Wink Tay. Right. That's the uh, pronunciation, yeah. Wingte. Wingte, and and this is. I think that's uh, the right pronunciation. That's the Lakota word for for uh, for transgender, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So this was a transgender character, and and you know, reading the historical notes that you had, that it seems like, as far as people understand, there was a actual transgender Indian that was played a part of this story, and you know, was, um, you know, you depict this person in the book as. Uh, being a source of wisdom and someone that Crazy Horse went to for advice and uh, the tribes in general went to to help them, you know, prepare for the battle. And, you know, it just, it seemed to me quite striking because uh, given that transgender people today are still encountering a huge amount of resistance to being kind of assimilated and accepted into society, you know, seemingly the indigenous peoples at this time period, you know, or already completely accepting and revered almost this person um, in some ways. And I was just curious to the extent to which you were able to, to, to understand why that might have been the case for them versus at the time, I would have imagined anyone that was transgender in 1866 in America would, would certainly not have been comfortable being public. In European that. American culture, right? Yeah. Well, it was a a fascinating character and people may see that and think, Oh my gosh, that's some sort of contemporary contrivance that's being injected onto this historical story. And it's, it's actually just the opposite. I came across, uh, the, the description of this character and I've named this character, uh, moon in the, in my story. We don't know, uh, or I have not come across in my research anyway, that the name of, of this person, the actual name, but there is historical documentation about this wink prophet, uh, that was a member that was a, a member of the Lakota. And the, the evidence for this historically is, uh, I came across in another book that I wrote, I wrote a nonfiction book about, a a 19th century conservationist and ethnologist, a guy named George Bird Grinnell, who was responsible in significant part in the 19th century for helping to save the buffalo and and create the seeds of the modern conservation movement. But he was also uh, an ethnologist. And he goes out uh, at the turn of the century, realizing that these native cultures are going to disappear. And he tries to document uh, as much as he as he can to help kind of preserve the culture. And as part of his research, one of the things he did is he interviews a Cheyenne warrior who had been involved in the Fetterman fight. Mm-hmm. And he goes out with this warrior and walks the Fetterman battlefield with this, uh, with this Cheyenne warrior who tells him about all of the things that happened on the, on the battle and before the battle. And one of the, the things that the Cheyenne warrior tells him is that there was a Lakota wink day, uh, transgender uh, person who came out uh, and prophesized what was going to happen. And that prophecy became very important to the to Red Cloud and the other chiefs deciding to have the battle in this place on that day. And that's that's historically documented from a book that George Berg Grinnell wrote. I can't remember the exact date. I want to say 1915 or something. So this this historical doc, historical documentation goes way back. And then in doing a little bit more research about the perception of of Winkte among the Lakota in that era, is that they were that they were known as as two souls or 
uh, as having the the wisdom of both men and women. And as you say, for having that wisdom of both genders, were revered by the people of the tribe and respected as, as having extra wisdom. And so they were relied upon as counselors, whether it was in personal matters of, of love or whether it was in matters of military strategy, as is the case in the story that I write. So it's just, it's a very uh, beautiful concept, I think, of, uh, of, of transgenderism. And it's interesting to me when you talk about lessons learned out of, out of, uh, out of history, this is, this is one that made a real impression on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, at the end of the book here, so, you know, we've talked about this and, and we'll leave it up to readers to read that there's, you know, a big chunk of the book is devoted to the battle and to fight. And, and a lot, of course, interesting things happen. So we don't want to give too much away, but you mentioned in the historical notes section that, after the kind of the massacre, the disaster, everything that happened, that uh, Carrington, which maybe <laughs> maybe plenty of people might do in this situation, but tried to shift blame away from himself and uh, and right. kind of enlisted two separate wives <laughs> to, yeah. to possibly assist with this and and try and shift it to Fetterman. And it turns out it's now named after Fetterman for better or for worse. Um, and you talk about how this, you know, could have been just as much of the fault of Grumman's and, you know, you sort of picked that, that, you know, second element, maybe in terms of the storyline for the book that perhaps it was more Grumman's responsibility than, than Fetterman's. And, and you also obviously throughout the book depict Carrington's in a, in a, inability to be a leader, um, in a way that I'm sure he would not have been you know, so happy about, you know, during right. his lifetime, at least when he was trying to shift responsibility away. So, you know, given that this is very contentious and everything about that day, there's, there's a million different perspectives and, and everything. I guess I'm yeah. curious to know how you decided to use one particular kind of storyline over the other. Yeah. Well, there's, as you mentioned, the historical narrative on this battle was largely crafted by Colonel Carrington, who is a survivor. Um, he's back at the fort while the fight is taking place. And in large part to shift the blame away from himself, he picked the scapegoat. And the scapegoat that he picked was Fetterman, who was the ranking officer that goes away from the fort that day and is engaged in the battle. And he had help in that, as you mentioned, and I won't reveal too many details on this, but from, from two different wives who also wrote their own books and kind of conveyed this same story of Fetterman as kind of the brash, arrogant soldier who disobeyed orders and rides over the ridge line despite what Carrington had, had you know, told him not to do and leads his men to, to uh, calamity. Um, and that story was pretty much unchallenged for you know, a hundred plus years. There are a couple of more recent books, kind of academic, more ap academic style books that I list in the back of, in the historical notes section of, of my book that I think have done a really good job of digging into the, to the history of the, of the incident in the way that nonfiction books do a good job of and really coming up with a different explanation that while still put some of the blame on Fetterman because he was the commanding officer on the field, put more of the blame ultimately on Grumman, who is mm -hmm. we've talked about already. And for a number of reasons, I think the explanation of these more recent accounts of the battle is a lot more compelling. And so that's the kind of, uh, of lane that I picked in terms of uh, kind of deciding uh, who I thought was more to blame. I, I am pretty careful uh, and very deliberately in the historical notes to, to kind of try and be as transparent as I possibly can be about where I've made particular assumptions. And I list, uh, you know, resources for further reading if people are interested in looking at some of these, these accounts themselves, because there is some historical controversy here and mystery. Mm -hmm. And I think I've written a, uh, 
a interpretation that's that's pretty defensible and and and, and makes sense. But people can also make their own mind up about this, and there's 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 plenty of room for uh, for speculation. Yeah. Well, as we kind of wrap things up here, I'm curious to know. You know, we've t- we've covered a lot of ground today. We've covered you know multiple you know all both sides perspectives and and what all have been going on throughout the book and that that period. Uh, was there any other ideas or things that you hoped people might take away from this book that we haven't covered yet? Well, one thing maybe I'll mention is just the the title is is ridgeline and and obviously there's a physical ridgeline in the story that is the ridgeline that the u.s army rides across at the in the beginning of this this uh epic battle at the at the that's the 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 last part of the of the book and so there's there's that ridgeline that is that is significant as part of the story but I think all of the characters in this book on all, all sides in one way or the other are grappling with change in their lives and they're living in confounding, disorienting times and trying to gain some measure of control against that backdrop. And there was something that was very contemporary about that given the difficult period that we all have just lived through with with COVID that that made it feel that much more contemporary to me. Mm-hmm. And so to me, I guess that that theme of change is and dealing with change comes through in all the characters. And that ridge line moment is really that and this comes you ask about hiking in the West. And this is a moment that I love on hikes is coming up to a ridge line cresting that ridge and then looking down upon these kind of vast western landscapes that we have out here and not knowing what you're going to see Hmm. and i think all of the characters in the book are at that moment where they're about to to crest a ridge line and they don't know what's going to be on the other side and how they all deal with that to me is the is the very human part of the story yeah yeah agreed um all right well let's do a quick thunder round I'll ask you some yeah. fun questions and we'll call it a day. Sound good? Okay, sure. All right. What is your favorite food and drink? Favorite food and drink. Favorite food, probably Mexican food of of any, well, not any variety, but most varieties. <laughs> uh, favorite favorite drink is uh, malty beer, uh, preferably uh, uh, Montana craft brews or, or Belgian Trappist. Ooh, the Trappist Dales. Very nice. <laughs> okay, man of quality. Uh, where is your favorite place you've ever been? Favorite place I've ever been. Um, there is a high alpine lake in the Bob Marshall wilderness that is probably my favorite place on the planet. Ooh, okay. And last question if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Um, wow. That feels like a, 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 uh, I feel like I'm going to answer this wrong and miss an opportunity here. Um, no wrong answers. Well, without thinking too much, I, I am saddened by the, the division and conflict in the, in the country right, right now. And if I could wave a magic wand and give us all more understanding and tolerance of each other, that's something I would certainly want to do. All right. Fair enough. And on that note, um, Michael, Punk, it has been so wonderful to have you today on the podcast. Uh, the book again, Ridgeline, a novel from the best-selling author of The Revenant. Michael, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. 